Brave Jane Austen, Reader, Writer, Author, Rebel, by Lisa Plisko, illustrated by Jen Chorus. For my father, who with his steadfast love has encouraged me all my life. For Iris Naomi. A long time ago, in a tiny village in England, there was a little girl named Jane. There was no reason to think she would grow up to be anything out of the ordinary. She lived with her family in a big old house with low crooked rafters and a cellar that flooded. For light, they used candles. When the weather was cold, wood was burned in the fireplaces. And when it was hot, there was nothing that could be done about it. It was a good thing Jane's house was so big, for there were quite a lot of people in it. She had a papa and a mama, a sister, and six brothers. There were other boys who lived there too, Papa's students. Papa had a school at home where he taught the boys and his sons. He looked after the family's farm. He was the rector. Each Sunday, he stood tall in the old gray church, telling everyone about God and his mysterious ways. He used long, complicated words that to Jane were almost like another language, strange and beautiful. Papa worked hard. So did Mama. From dawn till dusk, in and out she went, in charge of the house and the garden, the children, the chickens, the cows, even the bees humming in their hives. And everywhere, it seemed, were boys, large and small, taking up a great deal of space. Where was Jane amidst this bustle and clatter? She watched and listened, thinking, learning, and playing too, for she and the others had a love. Inside, in Papa's study, was a globe that spun and a microscope that made large the little wonders of the world. The animacules, Papa called them. And there were books, not dozens, but hundreds of them, all lined up on the shelves, as if waiting like secrets that wanted to be told. In the evenings, in the parlor, Papa would read out loud. Here, in this one dim room, into the mind's eye came the brave deeds of kings and the quick flash of swords. They were funny clowns and sad lovers, tricks and jokes, tears and battles, wizards, monsters, fairies, fools, mountains, storms, ships crossing the dark, deep dark sea, soft beaches and bright stars beyond counting. As Jane came slowly to understand, even though they were all gathered under the same roof, girls and boys led very different lives. The boys had school and lessons. They climbed trees and hunted and rode horses. Someday they would be gone off to take their place in the world as sailors, soldiers, lawyers, landowners. But girls learned to sew and mend, to sit up straight and be polite. They were to be good. And Jane saw more, the shadow of poverty that fell hard upon the family. When she was seven, two new boys came, paying students for Papa. They took the room she shared with Cassandra, her older sister. The girls were sent to the faraway house of Mrs. Colley, who had a small, inexpensive school of her own. It was so different. It wasn't home. Mrs. Colley was cold, and the town was noisy and dirty. Soon Mrs. Colley took them to another town which was noisier and dirtier still. There, a terrible sickness caught hold of Jane. It was hard to tell if she would live or die. Mama came hurrying to save Jane and bring her daughters home. It took many months for Jane to get better. What could she do while everyone else was busy? She could read. Letters had become words, words had become sentences. Paragraphs became pages. Jane could read the books in Papa's study all by herself. So that is what she did. Shakespeare, Johnson, Cowper, Swift, Richardson, Defoe, and more. A dazzling universe opened up to her. Somehow, Mama and Papa scraped together enough money to send Jane and Cassandra to school again. This time, it was the Abbey School for young ladies, where the pupils were taught a bit of spelling, penmanship, and French. They had some lessons in music and dancing. These were the things a girl should know, to be ladylike, to be a good wife. And in Jane's world, getting married was the only thing a girl could hope for when she grew up. A girl who didn't marry was odd, a failure, maybe both. There was Jane, nine years old, far from home. At the Abbey School were girls whose families had more money and were thought to be better, more important than Jane's. These girls could look forward to glittering balls and beautiful gowns. They could dream of weddings and happily ever after. Jane watched, listened, thought. When Jane was 10, she and Cassandra came home. There was no more money for school. Jane kept on reading. That was her school. But now it wasn't enough to simply read. She came from a writing family. 
Papa with his sermons, Mama with her funny poems, older brothers who wrote and shared in the evenings to applause and laughter. Jane decided to try it too. What would she write? Her head was filled with bits and pieces of everything she had been reading. Perhaps she could start by rearranging what she already had. So Jane began to write some little things. They were like the books she knew, but just as Mama, with her scraps of fabric and small, neat stitches, could turn an old gown into a new one, Jane found herself creating something new, something different. Were the girls in her stories sweet and obedient? Not at all. They were greedy and selfish and vain. Were her young men noble and wise? Oh, no. They were silly and foolish. Jane's characters, with names like Mrs. Kickabout, Pistoletta, Sir Edward Spangle, Old Humbug, behaved badly and did ridiculous things. There were places called Pammy Diddle and Crank, Crank Hum Dunbury and Kill Who Berry Park. There were cudgels and dungeons, fried cow's feet and stinking fish. Jane's imagination soared like a wild bird. Her writing wasn't the least bit ladylike, but it was funny and clever. Her family laughed and clapped and laughed again. She wrote and wrote, getting better all the time. One day, Jane met a handsome, intelligent young man. His name was Tom. Like Jane, he loved to laugh and to dance. Jane liked him. He liked Jane. But they both were poor, and quickly, Tom's family had him sent away. Many girls Jane's age had already married, had homes of their own and children to care for, but not Jane. Tom was gone, and Jane was the girl who wrote. So she wrote a longer story. It was different from anything she had written before. The heroine of First Impressions was a smart young lady named Elizabeth. She loved to laugh and dance and came from a family that didn't have much money. One day she met a handsome, rich young man, Mr. Darcy. Some of his relatives and friends didn't approve of Elizabeth, but she proudly stood up for herself. And in the end, Mr. Darcy, who feared he would lose Elizabeth forever, married her. They were to live happily ever after. Jane's family loved First Impressions. They loved it so much that Papa even sent a letter to a publisher in a far-off London. Should you give any encouragement, he wrote, I will send you the work. It would be unladylike to publish a book, for that was something that mostly men did. But if it happened, Jane could know for sure she was a real writer, and she could earn money of her own. The publisher said no. What did Jane do then? Life went on. She read, sewed, planned menus for family meals, she took long walks and played the piano. She went to parties and visited relatives. She helped take care of her parents. She helped take care of her nieces and nephews. And in between all this, she kept on writing her funny, thoughtful stories. When Jane was 26, a young man named Harris asked her to marry him. Harris was so different from the Tom of long ago. But if she said yes, she could be like other women. And she would never have to worry about money again. She could live in a grand house, wear beautiful gowns, eat the most expensive foods. Jane did say yes. But the very next day, she told Harris that she had changed her mind. Years later, she would write, anything is to be preferred or endured rather than marrying without affection. Hard times followed. Papa died. Dear Papa, who with his steadfast love had encouraged Jane all her life. Now it was just Mama and Cassandra and Jane on their own. They moved and moved again, always scrimping and contriving. Jane had worked hard on her stories, but nobody, it seemed, wanted to publish them. Then came the news that one of Jane's brothers had a house where they could live. Mama, Cassandra, and Jane settled down once more, and something wonderful happened. Jane's story about two sisters, called Sense and Sensibility, was published. At last, she was an author with a book filled with her words that she could hold in her hands, turn its pages, place on a shelf. Soon, Jane's story, First Impressions, now called Pride and Prejudice, was also published. When she received her first copy in the mail, she wrote joyfully to Cassandra, I have got my own darling child from London. People liked these two books so much, the publisher had to print more copies. Jane was earning money. Two more of her stories were published, Mansfield Park and Emma, all over England, people were buying, reading, and enjoying Jane's books. Even the Prince Regent loved them. He had his librarian go see Jane, and she was invited to visit the palace. It was like spring finally arriving after a long, dark winter. Jane's dream of being a writer and an author had come true. She had more stories she wanted to tell, 
other books she wanted to share, a tale about a girl who liked ghosts and mysterious castles, and another story, more serious, about a lady, not so young anymore, who thought she had lost the love of her life. Jane kept writing, but she began to feel unwell. As the months went by, her health worsened. The doctors could do nothing to help her. When she was 41 years old, Jane died, held close in the arms of her sister, Cassandra. The two books, Northanger Abbey and Persuasion, were published later that year. Who would have thought, when Jane was a little girl, scribbling away in her tiny village, that one day the Prince Regent would admire her, would respect her talent? And who would have thought that 200 years later, Jane would be one of the most beloved writers in the world? Today, Jane's books can be found in just about every country, in many different languages, on shelves and on screens, and in people's hearts. Her words and ideas, her stories and her laughter are everywhere.